Clean Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today, our guest is Anthony King. He is a professor of security studies at University of Exeter with his particular interest in urban and land warfare. Welcome, Professor King. Hello. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Uh, we are looking at the war in Ukraine against like Russia has invaded Ukraine in February 22. And since then, we have seen how two large armies, uh, each of them like over 100,000 people, is fighting continuously along the front line of over 1,000 kilometers. It is absolutely not what we have used to experience in Europe since decades. And does it mean that the age of mass armies and 1,000 kilometer long front lines has come back to Europe? Well, this is a great question and a really important one in trying to understand contemporary conflict. The two armies that are fighting um, the Russo-Ukraine war, the Ukrainian armed forces and the Russian army, are large. uh, And they're large by the kinds of standards that we've seen uh, in various civil conflicts. Um, So the Ukrainian armed forces started the war with about an army of about 120,000. The reports are now with increased conscription, increased um, numbers of recruitment, the the force is about 200,000 strong, the combat force is about 200,000 strong, with a larger, much larger militia doing other uh, other roles. So it's a large army, probably in terms of actually deployed forward, 120 to 180, maybe maybe 200,000 forward. Uh, And the Russians started the war with 190,000 troops, probably about 140,000 combat troops, um, and they've reconstituted themselves to a much larger force. Uh, the upper figure for that force is, uh, there's, the, the, there's been claims there's 400,000 uh, Russian troops in Ukraine. I must admit, I'm slightly sceptical about that figure, but I would s- certainly say the Russians are fielding an army of 150, 200,000 inside Ukraine. So, so these are large forces, but let us compare them with the 20th, 20th century. So if we look at the last time there was major fighting uh, in Ukraine, which was 1943-44, when the Red Army threw the Wehrmacht out, uh, the Red Army retook Ukraine with a force of 3 million uh, soldiers, 20 armies, 5 army groups, and the Wehrmacht that fought against them was about 1 million strong. So although they are very large armies, and they are large armies, um, larger armies than we have typically seen in the civil conflicts that have characterised the 21st century, they are in historical terms, especially in comparison uh, with the 20th century, relatively small. Now, what does that mean? That a front line has developed, but it's not as densely held as uh, the front line, the front that fought across um, Ukraine in 1942-43. And therefore, the fighting has concentrated on congr- and congregated on particular areas, uh, even in this frontal stage of the fight in 2023, where, where there has been a, a front developed, um, it's still concentrated on specific sectors because neither force has dense soldiers, dense numbers of troops uh, across the whole front. And it's concentrated. We now can see it's concentrated in three areas, Bakhmut, um, Orivka, uh, and Veleka uh, and Novosilka. So we've got these concentrations. So what I suggest is there are parallels, similarities, but we should not confuse 21st century mass with 20th century mass. But, uh, in your books, uh, you have uh, written many of them on urban and land warfare. You describe how these uh, concept of a war changed from the mass armies and from the huge battles on the field like Waterloo or Brodino or uh, Gettysburg and how it changed dramatically into fighting uh, in cities like every uh, quarter, every house, for every house, like actually from Stalingrad uh, when we uh, think about the the, um, uh, the urban warfare but most intensively in the last decades, Mosul and other cities. And now we have seen uh, intense 
fightings in the cities of Divka, Bakhmut, when the cities have been practically erased by this fighting. What does it tell us about the nature of modern war and is it a sign of the change of this nature? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, um, it, there, there are continuities in terms of warfare uh, and the continuities are long standing. They go back to the 20th century. They can, they're actually traceable right back to antiquity. But a significant part of the answer to this question lies in the discussion we've just had about force numbers. So what it suggests is this. Why, why do we see so much urban warfare in the 21st century? Why has so much of the fighting in Ukraine uh, concentrated and converged on urban areas and, and in these intense urban fights for Kyiv, for Bakhmut, for Severodonetsk? Well, my answer here would be this, um, and it goes back to the previous discussion we just had. Because um, armed forces are so much smaller than they were, the fundamental geometry of land warfare has changed. So in the 20th century, mass armies uh, had to have a very large space to deploy on. Generals wanted to deploy all their combat power. They needed a large area on which to deploy their forces so that they could support them with road and rail systems. The result is, in the 20th century, we see the rise of, of fronts, very large, densely held fronts, First World War, Second World War, Korea, where there's very large fronts held by lots of troops. Because most of the combat power is in the field on these fronts, most of the battles take place in the field. There's major engagements in the field between combat forces. Now, periodically, and you mentioned uh, Stalingrad, which is a really good example. Um, periodically, um, because the fronts were punctuated by towns and cities, mass 20, 20th century forces would fight in and for those cities. And they were very intense series a series of fights. And in the Ukraine campaign of 1942-43, uh, there were very major fights over what was then Kharkov and Kiev. Uh, very, but most of the fighting and most of the intense battles took place in the field. We now are in a situation where those geometries are inverted. Yes, the Russians have deployed a large force or a large force by 21st century standards. The Ukraine have constituted or reconstituted a relatively large force. But they're not large enough to hold very dense fronts right across Ukraine. So what's happened? The Russians, in their attack on Ukraine, in their invasion, have converged on decisive locations. Kyiv for strategic reasons, but then, as they consolidated east and south, their forces converged on actually sometimes quite small towns like Bakhmut, like Rabizne, Severodonetsk is not even a very big town. Why? Because to prosecute their future campaign, to prosecute land operations, they had to own certain roads, certain road junctions, certain road bridges, railheads, etc. And therefore, where were those uh, key bits of infrastructure, those key um, logistical enablers located, they're located in urban areas, in towns like Severodonetsk, etc. And the other thing, as the Russians found out at Chernihiv, you can't bypass these areas because you get attacked in the rear, in the, this case very effectively, by Ukrainian forces. So the result is the geometry of 21st century warfare changes from one where the field is dominant to where actually forces tend to converge on urban areas. Now, that doesn't mean there's no fighting in the field. For instance, there's lots of fightings, in, and it continues in the hills around Bakhmut, because Bakhmut is a small town, because there are so many soldiers there. It spills out into, into the field around it. But the pattern has changed, where the urban areas become essentially concentrated points. They become fortified strongholds like an, a, a medieval fortress or a citadel or a fortified city, which the field armies actually have to fight for and to take. And so we get a shift in which the urban fighting, it's not exclusively urban, but where we get a shift where that becomes the predominant paradigm of uh, land fighting. 
But it's not only the paradox that you have mentioned to fortresses, and fortresses w- were built uh, primarily to to be strongholds and to uh, deflect and attack. Of course, there had been like storages of, of food. Of course, like people could live there, and they had even livestock. But it were mostly the uh, tools to maintain the garrison and the prince or the king or whoever. And the cities which we are talking about, like Bakhmut, is uh, uh, a compound of hundreds and hundreds of living houses, of multi-story houses with standard flats. It was not built to uh, sustain any fight, but it was forced to be practically a territory with intense fighting of uh, extensive, extensive destruction power. Like, how does it affect the the uh, the whole idea of warfare? You cannot uh, hold Bakhmut after that. You can hold the territory, but you cannot hold the city or the town because the town doesn't exist anymore. Well, for civilians, it is true. As high intensity warfare increases, the civilians tend to um, evacuate, and that's been a feature not only of uh, of the Ukraine war, but all of the wars we've seen over the last. Uh, 20 years that uh, that as the urban battle intensifies the city becomes a battlefield in which large numbers of there's still often civilians there but the large number of refugees so what 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 I what would I suggest in a place like Bakhmut Bakhmut Severodonetsk or Bizne none of these towns Kiev was 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 not designed as a fortified city of an early modern um, or even modern and certainly not a medieval type However, the natural topography of a city, of an urban area, lends itself eminently to defence and defence against modern weapon systems. Because absolutely, modern weapon systems, artillery fire, rocket fire, um, artillery uh, airstrikes will destroy large parts of the city. But... Because the city is so complicated, because it's built of concrete buildings, you can create tunnels underneath, as, of course, Hamas have in Gaza. But you can build, uh, you can construct uh, passageways underneath the in the subterranean areas um, and the troops can disperse and hide themselves in in these urban areas. Even even though the purpose of these towns was never military in a sense that a medieval town had had a military function, they actually become highly uh, useful, even optimal places from which to defend because uh, each building can be fortified into a stronghold. Although the whole city is not designed as a defensive position, blocks in the city, buildings in the city can be turned into uh, defensive positions very effectively. So, for instance, take one example of one small battle, Battle of Rabizne. Uh, in February to May uh, 2022. Never designed to be an urban stronghold. Uh, But what the Ukrainian armed forces did very effectively was to fortify and barricade themselves into a series of um, concrete garages and low-rise buildings in the southwest of the town. And they were, they were, it was very difficult for the Russian forces to, to um, force them out of Rubizne. And Rubizne cost the Russians about a brigade's worth of forces, even though there weren't many Ukrainian troops within Rubizne. So you can improvise. In a modern city, it's eminently possible to improvise a fortified defensive position. There's another point here about the way urban areas and have, have worked can work and did work for the Ukrainians and still are working for the Ukrainians and indeed for the Russians in, in, in Ukraine. And, and this, is, this is important to recognise. Um, so in terms of the closed battle, infantry soldiers and, and some mechanised troops can create these fortified strongholds. In, if we look at, for instance, early modern Europe and uh, the, 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 a fortress or a fortified city had a had um, uh, was organised into a series of bat- bastions, which then in front of those bastions was a glacis, an open area on which advancing troops would be subjected to artillery and, uh, and musket fire. They were basically kill zones. The glacis was a kill zone. There are kill zones in contemporary urban warfare, but with 
long range weapons, the kill zone becomes miles outside the city. So when Ukrainian forces are defending Kyiv or defending, were defending Severodonetsk or Rubizne, they were able to strike Russian forces miles away, kilometres away from that urban area. So the, the function that even a civilian urban area plays is actually very similar to an old-fashioned, early modern or medieval castle, but the geometry of it has stretched and changed. And even though you, th there's very few fortified cities it, that have been prepared as fortified cities, urban areas become very, uh, you know, really effective bastions from which you can mount defences. So, and, th and this is something the Ukrainians actually have, have leveraged off very effectively um, over the last 18 months. Uh, the, the use of an urban area as a nodal point, as a strong point from which to attrit and parry and repel Russian forces. Well, that is a very interesting uh, assessment of the development of the uh, later wars, uh, not only Russian-Ukraine war in Ukraine, you've also mentioned Israel-Hamas war uh, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, and of course, there are other examples. We're talking uh, to uh, Anthony King, who is a professor of security studies at the University of Exeter, with his uh, focus on urban and uh, land warfare. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. Uh, don't forget to uh, leave your uh, comments under this video. And we are going further uh, discussing the question, what is going on uh, in our understanding of uh, how wars are being fought. Uh, Professor King, you uh, have mentioned the destruction power and the concentration of destruction power. And uh, now we have the concept, we had all, actually all the time that concept that uh, with smaller units, the, the firepower of uh, the unit and of a particular soldier increases with new weapons, with new communication, and uh, with, the, uh, with the skills of the soldiers. And we know now the, the role of the drones, of communication device in the, in, in the warfare. How does it change the urban warfare, warfare in particular? Well, it's very important. So let, let's focus, first of all, on drones, um, because they've been the focus of such... Um, intense interest. So, um, you know, drones emerged uh, late 1990s. As a, they, 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 the history is longer, but as an operationally, tactically useful system, they emerged late 1990s, late 1990s, and have proliferated since then. And they've, in the last five to 10 years, there's been an acceleration, uh, and they've become a ubiquitous uh, feature of the battlefield, uh, remote systems, and some quasi-autonomous systems. If you, if you take loitering munitions as, um, as autonomous, i.e. they've been pre-targeted or they, they program to spot signatures, sort of a, a little bit of creeping autonomy has, uh, uh, has emerged. But the remote system of uncrewed aerial systems have become totally ubiquitous. And the figure uh, you know, whether it's entirely accurate, it's open to question, but the figure that, that's been uh, cited is a, from a Rusi study in London is that Ukrainians, for instance, have been using 10,000, uh, have been expending 10,000 drones, mainly small ones, every single month. That drones are a ubiquitous element of warfare, that every single platoon, every single company has a whole suite, an armory of drones, which they're using all the time. What are the functions of those drones? Twofold. One, target spotting. This has been totally universal by Russian and Ukrainian forces. And it makes life quite difficult for soldiers on the front line. And we've seen, you know, disturbing, I think, disturbing footage in the sense, you know, you know as, especially as civilians, I think it's disturbing to be exposed and to potentially celebrate this footage. But there's been lots of footage of, for instance, uh, U uh, Ukrainian drones identifying Russian tanks, Russian vehicles, Russian soldiers, and then being struck by artillery, or the, or, uh, or alternatively, the drone itself being a loitering munition, and it, it explodes onto the position. 
And the fact is, we're not so exposed to it, but the Russians are doing exactly the same thing. And that footage is also available uh, at certain parts of the Internet if we were going to look there. So drones have been used for have been used for two functions. One, to acquire targets. And secondly, to actually strike and destroy those targets. And those functions have, have come down from a high level all the way down into infantry platoons and even to squads. What, what difference does it make? Well, it does make a difference. Drones, and especially drones in large numbers, um, are effective weapon systems. They make platoons and companies more capable. They can strike at greater range, so the actual a range at which a company or a platoon of infantry soldiers uh, can be lethal, can strike to, has increased as a result of drones. Uh, they can see further, they can strike further. Um, and similarly, simultaneously, of course, they can be struck more easily. So, uh, what, what, so, so this is an important development. Is it a radical development? In my view, no, it isn't. It, it's an augmentation, an enhancement of the combat power of these forces, of these infantry forces in particular. But it's not a revolutionary change. It allows them to spot targets further away. It allows them to see things uh, better further away and on the other side of the hill. What is its effect on actual warfare? Well, here we reach an interesting paradox. So in the literature on drones, and especially the more utopianistic, futuristic literature, there's an assumption that dr autonomous drone swarms are about to appear. I think some form of autonomous drone swarms is possible. So instead of just remote drones, which are being used now, more autonomous drones will be, uh, will be used. And the presumption here is that this will make war very quick that you'll be able to strike whatever you want, whenever you want. And so therefore, uh, military operations, warfare will become quick, decisive, lightning, uh, for a lightning speed. At, at this point, I totally disagree. And we can start to see this in the Russo-Ukraine war. With the proliferation of drones, actually, it's enhanced and intensified the urban siege positional warfare that we've seen. So the point here is, and we can see it very clearly in battles like Bakhmut, because both the Ukrainians and the Russians have huge numbers of drones and therefore can see everything everyone else is doing, it's very difficult to manoeuvre. Manoeuvre, uh, perception, um, rapid infiltration, all of these things that were typical in the 20th century become much more difficult because both sides have the same weaponry. So for me, there's a, there's a paradoxical element. Yes, drones have enhanced the combat capability of military forces all the way down into the infantry platoon. But ironically, the result is that warfare concentrates and converges on urban areas and around urban areas, it becomes ever more attritional and ever more positional, precisely because these forces are also armed with drones and other forms of advanced technology and weaponry. So that uh, sounds uh, paradoxically indeed, uh, this um, years-long dream of uh, 30, uh, 360 degrees a uh, battlefield when every soldier knows the position of another one and they're constantly communicating and seeing the battlefield in 3D picture and knows exactly where to go and uh, whom to whom to fight, it uh, uh, actually freezes the, the movement of the troops because the enemy knows exactly the time and so it turns to be um, a sort of stalemate. But um, do our NATO troops have any similar experience uh, to what the Ukrainians have now? Uh, in the NATO armies, there is no usage of uh, quadrocopters, which are being mostly used by the Ukrainians. There is no use of FPV seaside drones. What we have mostly is wing drones, but it is quite another level for quite another purpose. Yeah. So I, I can't speak for the whole of NATO, um, but what I'd suggest is, so for instance, 
um, the US. And, and let, let me focus on the British Force, which I've seen doing a few experiments recently, which may be, may be of interest. So, Brit for instance, the British Army as a member of NATO has definitely been um, observing what's going on in, in Ukraine very closely. And I know also that other, some other NATO militaries have. The French, obviously the US and the Poles have been deeply interested in what's, uh, what's occurring in Ukraine. Now, the British Army itself um, has developed an experimental group, uh, an experimental trials group. And one of the central pieces of technology they're looking at it are, are remotely piloted aerial systems, i.e. drones of various types, quadcopters, nano drones, etc., etc. And uh, the, uh, the idea is to develop, to develop practices, to develop techniques, to develop doctrine so that these systems can be delivered reasonably quickly in the near future to the British Army so that um, the Brit a British Army platoon or company knows where to how to basically administer the use of these systems. So, for instance, the application of a drone system. If you if you give a company a, 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 an infantry company or a mechanized company drone system, you then need to have that organized into your organizational structure. You need drone operators. You need actually slightly different doctrine because traditionally uh, an infantry company, for instance, let's take that example, an infantry company would be thinking in two-dimensional lineal terms. So the commander would be thinking in terms of the ground. Well, if you're going to have... If drones are going to be part of your order of battle, they're going to be under command, the, the two-dimensional land battle becomes a three-dimensional battle and the company actually owns the airspace up to whatever, 500 metres above it or 300 metres above it. And so the British Army is experimenting, and I know other NATO forces are experimenting, with the um, different kinds of drones, different altitudes, different functions, uh, and they will start to get introduced. One of the problems with NATO, and all of the NATO members that I'm aware of, is just the scale. Um, the, you know, the, I've given this figure before, um, you know, as I say, I'm not, sure it's, I'm not sure even the authors of that report would say it's 100% accurate, but... The expenditure of drones is massive. We're, you know, the requirement is in the thousands. Um, and at that point, where are NATO, are NATO members actually equipping their armies with not 20, 30, 40, 100 drones, but thousands of drones? So every company has... Disp drones are just... Drones are, are, are no more meaningful than ra ammunition rounds, rounds of small arms fire grenade rounds, etc. And that is where I think there is a gap. Um, the, the actual scale of the, of the, of the requirement is not, has not been mat, met. Um, and that, that, I think, in terms of capability, is, uh, is an issue. The point is here is, of course, what we've talked about already is these capabilities cancel each other out. For sure they do, and they therefore reaffirm attritional warfare. Yes, but if you don't have the capability, you will be defeated in that those battles. So it's a matter of remaining comp uh, retaining some kind of competitive advantage. Uh, there were like talks, uh, which I hear from uh, the uh, Ukrainian army, from the Ukrainian militaries, that actually what we have now is the uh, with the FPV drones, uh, which like can hunt very precisely, like every single soldier and like hunt it down and drop a grenade or explode. We are actually experiencing uh, something what uh, in World War II we experienced with the development of the tanks, when suddenly people who uh, came with that concept believed that the tanks will help like to break through the defensive lines and uh, independently of if the drones can help to do that or not. It is a new type of weapon. The anti-drone warfare must be developed. The drone units must be created in addition to other units like artillery units or no idea like uh, air defense units. So we need to create like some new uh, type of, of troops which deal exclusively with the drones. Uh, do you share this concept or are, from your opinion, the drones are just a supplement to any other type of existing, existing uh, weapons? 
Well, this is a great question. This is a great question. Um, personally, I think that the drone is just another weapon in an armory. Does it need a specialist core? Um, it certainly needs operate. It needs you need to have operators who are skilled in the use of drones at every single level. So a company needs a group of drone operators, and just as importantly, counter drone operators who have jamming devices, who have various forms of means of of opposing drones. Now. How you organise that is, is really is a question that's quite is difficult to know. I certainly don't have a complete answer. So in the First World War, um, what you saw is the development of two new arms. A so you had a machine gun corps developed. So as the heavy machine gun was developed and its importance was recognised, um, armies, British Army, French Army, German Army, developed machine gun corps, i.e. specialist corps of troops who operated machine guns after the first world war those were dis the, the the specialist corps were just incorporated into the infantry essentially but of course with the tank with the tank the development of tanks the tank regiments and tank corps have always remained as a specialist arm i suspect what will happen is that small drones will be just incorporated into the field armies into the infantry and armoured units, and you'll have specialists who are inside those units. But I suspect that a higher level, so smaller drones, quadcopters that are used at infantry company squadron level, I think they will be just incorporated with specialists who are badged and I in integrated into those units. The higher level kind of tactical drones, more specialist system, well, it's possible there might be a, a drone regiment created, a counter drone, drone regiment at kind of brigade, battalion level. That's possible. I've not seen that development, uh, but it's possible. But this does go back to the fundamental point. I, I in no way am I, um, you know, rejecting in some kind of Luddite way the importance of drones. They are, they are a really significant development to the military armoury. But I would at the same time say they are just a contribution, an addition to a military armoury and their functions and the likely effects on the battlefield is actually, I think, you know, you wouldn't not want to have them. It's a significant effect, but not a radical one. Um, but, but in order to have that effect, to be able to see further, to strike more precisely, um, to strike deeper into the enemy at each level, undoubtedly specialists will be required to be integrated. The question is, how will militaries do that? And my answer would be, I think it will depend on the type of drones and I think it will depend on existing military cultures, military structures across NATO, how, how different members do that. Well, that is an interesting perspective, and of course, the military always adapts to what is going on, what is happening. Uh, we are talking to Professor Anthony King, uh, who uh, studies at uh, the uh, University of Exeter and who focuses as a professor of security studies on uh, urban and land warfare. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. And now we are diving into the last uh, part of our interview with Professor King. And I would, ask, I would like to ask you, uh, are we now experiencing some sort of renaissance of forgotten uh, ways of uh, of uh, having a war, like with trenches warfare, with drainage uh, pumping out water out of the trenches, or with creating huge minefields, which we have not seen like since eternity, uh, and all other techniques which remind uh, very much on uh, the Battle of Verdun or the others uh, on another scale, but with the same uh, atrocity and the same uh, the same hardness. Yeah. So this is this is a great question. I mean, in terms of the atrocities and the brutalities, um, you know, warfare is a is a beast that won't be tamed. And uh, the ideas that you get in certain types of literature that somehow because we have become a highly technologically enabled animal that somehow will make will 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 transcend our you know at the animal the pack animal basis of warfare um to me it's just an illusion 
Warfare is a brutal means, a means of organising violence to make one's enemy submit to one's will. And as that competition becomes more and more intense, brutality and savagery will re-emerge, will recur, as we've seen. So there's no solution. You know, warfare is, is a brutal activity. It will remain a brutal base activity. Um, will, do we see the, you know, the rediscovery of certain historic techniques? And you've cited the example of Verdun and certainly bits of the Battle of Bakhmut um, looked a bit like Verdun. Um, the uh, the um, counteroffensive, especially around places like Orivka, Ur um, reminded me of the Battle of El Alamein. The, the key thing with El Alamein in 1942 for the British was to break through the minefields. They had to break through the minefields before they could even start fighting. So there are these um, definite sort of uh, repetitions, these recurrences. I actually think, um, I look at the battlefield in um, Ukraine, and I'm not actually so reminded of the 20th century. Um, and, and, you know, this may be my bias because I myself am so interested in urban warfare, but I'm actually more reminded of early modern warfare, um, at where, of course, trench lines, the trench lines occurred around cities, where the fighting was positional, uh, where there was, there was extensive levels of brutality, and of course, the in, intense involvement of non-state mercenary and irregular forces in the fighting. So actually, for instance, you know, you look around Bakhmut, and yes, in a certain sense, it's like Verdun with the, the battle lines extending over the hills, but it's also like a Vauban um, siege of the late 17th century, where a series of siege lines develops around the city, uh, protecting the city and also trying to attack the city. So for me, actually, um, the, the sort of path that, that I see as most redolent is that period 1500 to 1800, those monarchical 30 years war and then the subsequent dynastic wars in Europe. Um, where, as I say, the fighting tend to congregate around urban areas. There were battles in the field, but most of the fighting was siege warfare as people tried to reduce each other's castles. And the, 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 the prevalence of, of, of um, trenches is part of it. The other point I'd say is interesting is that um, if, we, if we look at an early modern fort... Uh, what it used to consist of is a main, an early modern fortress used to consist of a main fortress surrounded by a series of outworks, bastions, hornworks, etc., some distance from the fort. And actually, if you look at, if you look at uh, a, 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 a uh, operation like Bakma, or if you look at the attempted fight for Topmat, what what you know the lines of the the lines of Sorovkin the Sorovkin lines which didn't get breached, you know are they the First World War? Is it the Siegfried line or are these the hornworks um, of Tokmat? Is this the is this the bastions, the outworks, the horn uh, the the hornworks of the town of Tokmat? And and this Ukrainian forces couldn't penetrate. They couldn't reduce the hornworks and the bastions, so they never got to the fortress itself. So I actually think uh, think of the geom the the sort of historical repetition in a slightly different way. Not Verdun, but actually the siege of Lille or the reduction of various fortresses. The siege of Ath at Vauban, his last siege in the 1690s. That's actually what comes to mind for me. Um, but of course, shot through all of this to emphasise and repeat is warfare will not be tamed. Um, humans, when they're involved, when combat begins, humans descend to a different place. And it just it, it, it's not to disparage the laws of war, but the reality is is violence and violence in an un, in, in an untrammeled, uh, unrestricted way. Um, and that that is our past. That is our present. And unfortunately, that is the future as well. But we have lived for uh, several decades in a, in a world where in our Western societies, we believe that only professional armies fight. 
Like in the United States, uh, the step out of the conscription was after the Vietnam War, uh, after all the protests against the conscription, against participation of conscripts in a, in a war like emerged. In Germany, we have canceled conscription at all, like several years ago. In the UK, uh, there is a professional army, and most armies are professional armies. And we believe that we can run our economies as uh, peacetime economies, and in a case of some conflict, not even a war, somewhere in a distant country, we can send like 10,000, 2,000, 3,000 of troops, support them with the aviation, and um, that's it. Um, now we see it's quite different in Ukraine and in Russia. Uh, of course, uh, a lot of civilians get conscripted, mobilized, sent to the front. We know how Ukrainian cities are suffering from the Russian air raids. We know how much the Ukrainian society and parts of European society invest their own money and their own passion into support of the army. So the war is once again not something small, which, uh, which affects only the professional corps of soldiers, but is once again a war which affects the society and the economy of the society. Uh, are we ready in the West to this development? Well, it's a great question. Um, and my answer is I don't think we are. Um, and, and I think Western democracies are struggling deeply to, to even begin to start this kind of discussion. Now, let me, let me say a couple of things. Um, so there's been quite a lot of commentary showing that, or arguing that the, the Russia-Ukraine war shows that the age of the professional military is over and that we're returning to a 20th century conscript model of mass forces. Um, I mean, certainly Russia, Ukraine and any future conflict of scale, a great, comp a great power competition of scale, requires a different kind of military force. I'm actually deeply sceptical that we've gone back to the 20th century. And I say two points. Firstly, um, a core, highly professional army uh, is essential to military capabilities. It provides the spine of the military uh, capabilities. And unlike, you know, where there's been periods of mass conscription, First World War, Second World War, etc., and that army then is expanded out to create a conscript force around the professional spine. Um, what I'd suggest is this, in the current era, is something slightly different. So the first point is this. What we tend to see um, is that professional core, and you could see it happening before the Russo-Ukraine war. We could see it in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the fight against ISIS. The professional core of the Western military then partners with a series of regular and irregular, in those cases, indigenous forces. So the spine is provided by a Western professional military, small, bespoke, tailored, exquisite. Um, and it's, it's, it, then there's some bulk provided by regular, irregular, um, partnered allied forces. So, for instance, Kurds. Iraqi forces against ISIS, Afghan National Army, Afghan police in Afghanistan. So various, and, and, and it's not just the West who do this. Iran do it, Russia do it massively in terms of that irregular, uh, regular support. Then comes this important question of what happens to the citizens? What happens to the citizen army? It is completely true. The Ukrainians have introduced a form of conscription, and the Russians have certainly informed some, in, introduced something that is definitely an almost enforced form of conscription on some of their population. And, and, and that's a really important development. It's a really important development which differs from the period 1990 to 2020. So we get something where the professional force is no longer entirely enough. But I would suggest what we're seeing in these conscriptions is not the same as the 20th century. So, for instance, if we look at Ukraine in the Second World War, the Ukraine at that point was about, had a population of about 40 million. And about 3 million of that population was mobilised either for the Red Army or, in fact, for the Wehrmacht or for partisan local resistance, Ukrainian resistance fighters. About 2 to 3 million. So it's a very large force. Note the level of recruitment um, that 
the Ukrainian army has expanded to about 200,000. So it's a very large force, but really very small in comparison with the 20th century. And note also the level of resistance. So we know in Russia, many civilians, many males have, have tried to avoid conscription. And although it's a lesser stated story, the fact is that many uh, males in Ukraine have also, you know, lots of them are absolute Republicans and have, have volunteered, etc. But there is a significant level of resistance. Now, the, I'm not moralising about the level of resistance. As a sociologist, what's interesting about the level of resistance is states, even when they're in an existential struggle, no longer have the authority and legitimacy to conscript and mobilise their civilian for, so civilians for military service at, at, in a mass scale, in a truly mass scale. So for me, absolutely, we have seen and we will see the use of conscription and various other more forms of civilian mobilisation, but it won't be on a scale that we saw in the 20th century. It will be a sort of raising of uh, additional auxiliary elements, which, which the numbers of which are pretty significant, but not approaching that truly national mo mass mobilisation of the type uh, that we saw 1914 to 1918, you know, 1939 to, to 45. Well, that is a very deep insight. Uh, thank you for that. The uh, Russia's aggression against Ukraine, full-scale invasion of Russia, uh, has demonstrated uh, the level of uh, the warfare of intensity which we can experience here in Europe, has demonstrated also a lot of new tactics we have not uh, been aware of, like the use of drones or of um, other devices. And now we need to digest it, of course, but first of all, to support Ukraine to win this war for freedom and for stability in uh, Europe. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was Professor Anthony King, who is a professor of security studies at the University of Exeter, with his particular interest in uh, urban and land warfare. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. Thank you, Professor King. Oh, thanks so much. It's a real pleasure to talk. It's, it's a really important topic and it's been wonderful talking to you. Thank you so much.